All right, so I'm going to talk to you today about what's new in the world of speech recognition. This is something, if you've ever seen me speak before, this is something that uh, you probably know I have great interest in, have talked about before. Um, so, but before I get into this, I want to ask a couple questions. It's always, always good to poll the audience. First of all, I want to know uh, who here has a mobile phone? All of you. That's terrific. I really was hoping for that. Okay, so the next question I want to ask is who has a boss or a manager or somebody that you report to? Most of you? Yeah, okay. As it turns out, I do too. And what my boss wanted me to uh, ask all of you is to justify my being here by taking a picture of me, putting it on Twitter or other social media of your choice, um, just so he knows I actually came and spoke to all you fine people. Uh, I will, my contact information will be later, but I would, I would love it if you could help me out with that. Um, okay, so with that bit of introduction, my name is Ben Klang. I am the Vice President of Business Technology for a company called Power Home Remodeling. We do uh, windows, siding, and doors, and you might not think there's any technology in that, and uh, I'm happy to say that there is. Formerly, I was uh, the principal of Mojo Lingo, which was a, um, is a real-time applications consultancy, building all kind of really cool apps. And I've been doing real-time communications and telecom type stuff for about 15 years, and in particular, evangelizing WebRTC and what it can do since 2013. So the first thing I want to explain is why speech recognition? So there's kind of the obvious, right? I mean, speech recognition is such a natural interface. It's a really easy way. Uh, it takes very little training to interact with something. You can, if you do it right, you can just speak to it, just as you would a friend or uh, you know someone you might be doing business with. But I think also it's interesting because communications is kind of moving away from a standard computer or even just a smartphone. It's moving toward embedded things like cars and uh, Amazon Echo style devices that live on your desk. And it's moving from more specific devices like a telephone who has you know, basically one purpose to more generic devices that can do many different things. So speech recognition opens up a, a, new, a new interface, a new way of interacting with the things around us. And it's pushing this thing, this idea called conversational user interface. This is a new style of interface. I mean, certainly people have built conversational systems in the past. But there's a tremendous growth of the technology that supports it and a lot more thought that's going into it. Um, and that's, that's kind of what I want to talk about is, is how we can use that uh, to, to build new interfaces. So last year I gave a talk. It was called The Five Tenets. And these were my sort of guidelines, how I measure a real-time communications application you know, to, to, to uh, measure its effectiveness and to kind of see how modern it, it is. And the tenets I came up with were adaptability. So being adaptive is... Um, the application takes advantage of the capabilities of the device it runs on. It should be fluid, which means that my communication can move from device to device, and it still knows who I am and where I am in the conversation. It should be contextual, so who I am relative to the people I'm talking to and relative to the application, those, these, these things are important. The application should take that into account. It should be trustworthy. Uh, obviously, anything I say to the app should be safeguarded. I don't want, uh, you know, secret business deals or embarrassing information leaked. And it should be referenceable. So any conversation I have, I should be able to come back to it later. I should be able to search for it. I should be able to share it. I should have a URL. If you think about an IVR, sort of a traditional telephony system, when it comes down to it, it's, it's a very simplistic version of a virtual assistant, right? You, uh, it prompts you for something and you answer it either by pushing a button or speaking a small phrase. If you take that concept and extrapolate to what's possible, what we're getting to is this idea of a bot, a virtual assistant. And there's a lot of um, it, people in here use Slack. Who's familiar with Slack? So how, how many, how, you probably have seen uh, bots, things that you can add to your Slack application to do things like schedule appointments or remind you to do something. This is the same idea, but, we, and, and Siri is another in the same category. Um, this gives us the ability to integrate with other things. If we're gonna build a bot, there's a sort of workflow that has to be considered. And so the workflow looks something like this, and I'm going to focus on the audio exchange here. First of all, we've got a user at the top, and we've got our bot here. First, you have your input-output channel. This could be a telephone, although probably won't be. This could be a mobile uh, device. It could be a web browser. We're going to capture the audio, and we're going to send it off to something that will handle the recognition. This is the speech recognition phase. The only thing this is responsible for is taking audio and turning it into text. No understanding, no processing, just taking audio and turning it into text. The next phase is we have to understand the question. 
what is it the user is asking of us? So we need to take that text, which could come in phrased any number of ways. You know, uh, what's the weather today? How's the weather? Is it warm outside? All of these things are kind of getting at the same intent. Once we understand what the user is asking us, we need to do something with it. So we need to go figure out the answer. We need to research it. And usually you're going to reach out to more than one system, or quite often you'll reach out to more than one system. Uh, so you'll, I used API as sort of the example here, but any data store, any database, any directory, uh, or any third-party web service, something like this. Then obviously you need to respond. If we have a text-to-speech, excuse me, if we have a speech recognition input, we probably want a text-to-speech output so we can converse. And then, of course, that has to go back to the original channel so the user can hear uh, the, the response. This conversation is really going to focus just on these two pieces, though, the speech recognition piece and the natural language understanding. Now, I think speech recognition is probably pretty intuitive to most people. If I speak something, I expect the computer to understand my words, even if not my intention. The natural language part is a little bit more nuanced, and I want to kind of illustrate how NLU looks when you're, when you're working with it. So I took some screenshots from a tool. This one's called Wit, and I'll talk about it more in just a minute. But the cool thing about NLU is you can take a phrase like this one. What were the sales numbers for Michigan in July? And the, the tool will parameterize it. So it knows three things. First of all, it knows the territory I'm talking about, which is Michigan. It knows the date and time. It knows July, and although you can't see it here, it knows that I'm asking for the entire month, not just you know, one moment in time. And then it also understands the overall question, what were the sales numbers means, how much did we sell? So a tool like this should be able to handle the same question in different forms. How much were our sales last week in Chicago? So the phrasing of the question is different, as well as the position of the two uh, attributes. Obviously, this is not something you're going to do with a regular expression. You will go nuts. I tried. Don't try. Um, but these tools do a really great job of, of breaking this up for you. So as an application developer, I don't have to worry about what was said. I only have to worry about the structured response. Um, and I had one more example. How much do we sell last week in Georgia? Um, and I like the time, the time frame ones in particular because you can ask for things on almost an arbitrary time scale in very natural terms. So I can say last month, it means the last entire month. I can say last week, it means just a week. First quarter, it means the first three months of the year. So if we want to look at different services that can fulfill this need in, the, in our application, how do we measure them? How do we, how do we know they fit uh, our, our requirements. The first one, obviously, is it has to have good performance. And there are kind of two dimensions here. Um, it needs to be accurate. Obviously, we, want, we really want to know what, what was said. Um, but it also needs to be fast. Because in a lot of cases, if, if you're on a telephone, you know, 100 milliseconds of latency, 200 milliseconds of latency, you can feel that. If it takes five seconds for a service to respond, that's very awkward. So it should be accurate and it should be fast. It should also ideally support multiple language because the world is not just in English. Um, and, there, and languages, the speech recognition piece and the natural language piece are not necessarily the same thing. So whatever tools you provide, you need to make sure you have coverage for the languages you want to support. There should be some ability to provide hints. So a lot of the uh, virtual assistants you'll build will be very domain specific. You're solving a problem for your business, you're solving a problem for your customer, or you're solving a problem within one space, like uh, scheduling appointments, right? If you can't provide hints, the system can only apply sort of generic recognition, and your accuracy will be lower. So it's better if you can provide some kind of feedback to it. Ideally, it should be platform agnostic. What you don't want to do is be tied into one particular vendor's platform, hardware or software. Um, web services are, are a really good way of doing this because there's a nice uh, gap between what you're building and what they are. There's a standard interface. Uh, that's not true of all the platforms, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. And the last one, and I'll acknowledge this is just because I'm, um, I'm picky, it should have a good developer user experience. Developers are going to invest a lot of time in understanding this. There should be good documentation. The tools for debugging should be rich. Um, without a good developer experience, you'll have a hard time building and launching your application. So these are some of the things I considered, and I want to talk about some of the contenders that I looked at. You'll see a bunch of logos up here, probably a bunch that you recognize. Um, basically, everybody on this screen is a very large company. I mean, we've all heard of Apple and Google and AT&T and Amazon. Um, most of us have heard of probably Nuance, uh, IBM for sure. The two you might not recognize over here are WIT and API. And what I want to mention about those two in particular is 
Wit uh, was acquired last year by Facebook. So what you're seeing up here is not really just Wit, it's actually all Facebook. They've got a big play here. And the other one is API.ai, which um, they couldn't have timed this more perfectly. I think they did it just for me. They got themselves acquired by Google. So what you can see here is there are serious, there's, there's serious research, serious dollars going into it, and the, um, the potential is pretty big. The other thing I want to point out from this list is that it's kind of notable for who's not here. There really are, or there are only two companies on this um, screen that are sort of traditionally associated with uh, telephony. Nuance, obviously, is, is the 800-pound gorilla in the telephony um, recognition market. And AT&T, who, although they didn't have a major product to speech rec, they did have a lot of research into that area. Um, so really, what we're looking at is the companies like Facebook, like Google, like Apple, who are driving this forward. So I'll talk through some of these contenders. I'll go through each of them. I'll start with the ones that have more of a focus on just the speech recognition. All of the companies I talked about have some strengths in speech recognition and some strengths in natural language understanding, um, but they pretty clearly specialize. So I'll start with the speech recognition ones first. First, I'll mention AT&T Watson. Uh, yeah, not anymore. They sold it. Actually, they sold it a year ago to a company called Interactions. Um, who hasn't, to, as far as I can tell, done anything with it. I actually reached out to Interactions earlier this year to ask for an update, and I, I got nothing back, which is kind of a shame because this was always my favorite. In fact, the only reason I included it here is because all of my demos for the past three years, I used this in some way. Um, this, was a, it was, this was one of the first easy-to-use, API-driven, inexpensive speech recognition engines, but it's gone. Actually, in three days, the platform is totally being turned off. So I won't be demoing with it today. All right, let's talk about Nuance and Dev. So Nuance, as I mentioned, the one that we're more familiar with from the telephony world. They have, as you might expect, really great speech recognition language coverage. They cover 33 languages, and their platform, for, which is web-driven, API-driven, is called NDEV. It's really targeted at um, mobile device, or mobile app build, uh, builders. Their platform is production-ready. It's been, it's been in use for a while now. They also have an NLU product, the Natural Language Understanding. It's in private beta. I don't have access to it yet. Um, but it's coming. They're also relatively inexpensive. It's about eight-tenths of a cent per transaction, and the first 20,000 recognitions are free, so it's pretty easy to get started. They support a bunch of different codecs, um, and I always list these not so much because the codecs themselves are interesting, but because um, if you ever see someone that doesn't offer wideband audio, it's a red flag. Narrowband audio, you'll, your quality and accuracy will just be much worse. In this case, they do. They have 16K PCM, Speaks, wideband, AMR, um, and a couple others. I don't even think I can tell you what they are. Um, the, the one sort of weird thing about these guys is that the response you get is plain text. There's no metadata. There's no confidence score. There's no um, sort of the, the other stuff that comes back with an API response. You just get text back, which is weird. They're the only one that do that. So I thought I want to point that out. All right, the next one on this list is IBM Watson. Um, IBM Watson, a lot of people are probably familiar from Jeopardy. Anyone see uh, Watson defeat the contenders on Jeopardy? So the same kind of AI and, and smarts that they use to build that are also being applied for a bunch of other things, including speech recognition. Today on their platform, they offer seven languages for speech recognition. Um, they also offer five languages of natural language understanding, and it's production ready. I'd put an asterisk next to the second one because when I was working with it, I had a hard time with it. And I had some core features that I kind of took for granted from other platforms were missing. So while they claim it's production ready, I feel like it has a little bit to go before it really is a mature product. Um, but it's got a lot of promise and a lot of, a lot of budget behind it. It's also one of the more expensive ones. It costs two cents per minute. A lot of the other ones will allow you to do a shorter, um, you know, you can do a 15 or 10 second increment. This requires a full minute. Uh, and it, it, it's only the first thousand are free. It's still not expensive, but at scale, it's more expensive than the others. Interestingly, they allow FLAC, which is a lossless input, also PCM 16K, Opus, which is nice if you're doing WebRTC integration, no transcoding required, and sign linear. And they have a REST JSON interface, so that's a nice, easy uh, interface for developers. And the last from the speech recognition group is Google Cloud. I have to tell you, this, this announcement is actually why I put this talk together. So I mentioned before that AT&T Watson was kind of my go-to for speech rec, um, for demos. A lot, one of the other things that a lot of people used was an undocumented, unofficial, unsupported Google API. If you've ever gone to Google's homepage and clicked that microphone button, 
and spoken in your browser. Uh, this was using a service that Google provided for free through their browser to anyone who came to their homepage. Well, enterprising developers, being enterprising developers, figured out how to use it and started writing apps against it. But you can't build a service on something you can't pay for, because Google's API will change, or the formats will change, and then your application is broken. So they finally, this year, announced it um, as a paid service. You can go to Google Cloud, you can sign up for it, and you can use it, and there's an SLA and all that good stuff around it. It is technically still in beta, um, but it's been working pretty well so far. The other pretty amazing thing is that number right there, 80 languages. They entered the market with 80 languages. That's just unheard of. I mean, you saw IBM had seven, and Nuance, I think, had 30-something. That's just a tremendous amount of coverage. They do have a natural language understanding component to what they do, but it seems more targeted at things like taking a web page and extracting sentiment and, and entities from a, web, from a document rather than conversational. Um, so I really couldn't rate them on the NLU scale because it, for what I was trying to do, building a virtual assistant, it wasn't particularly useful. It's uh, relatively inexpensive, six, cents, six tenths of a cent, and it's also quarter minute billing, 15 second billing, and the first 240 are free. They also support FLAC, lossless, PCMU, and sign linear. Um, the other kind of interesting thing is they have two interfaces. They have REST JSON, which is simple and easy to use for everyone. The main drawback to REST JSON is that it's synchronous. I have to send my audio, and then I get my response back, and that can introduce delays in the conversation. They have this alternate interface called gRPC, which is Google RPC. It uses HTTP2 and a bunch of other magic. But basically, with HTTP2, you can stream a request and get a response as you're streaming the request. So this is how they do really cool things like when you, when you tap the button to do recognition and you start speaking, you see the words appear on the screen and even correct on the screen as you're talking. So that's, that is pretty cool. Um, OK. Oh, one other thing I will mention is I had a really hard time figuring out how to put it all together. The documentation is reasonable, but there are a lot of moving parts. Um, but it, it is workable. All right, so with that, I want to do a quick demo. I have it. This one? All right. So I built a little console. And I have asterisk running on my laptop. And I'm going to place a phone call. And when I speak, it's going to record about 15 seconds of audio. It's going to send the same exact audio to each of the three services. And then it's going to print what those services heard. Give them a little room. All right. So let's give that a shot and see what happens. Speak, and I will listen. Hi, everybody. I'm glad you came to see my talk today. I find speech recognition to be pretty interesting, especially when you uh, connect it to other services and APIs. So right now, it's uploading the request over conference Wi-Fi, which hopefully won't let me down, and start to get a response. It's so funny, when I, when I test this in my hotel room, it's perfect, it's flawless. And then I guess it's something about the, the audio in the room, it gets pretty funny. So the first one's good. Hi everybody, I'm glad you came to see my talk today. I find speech recognition to be pretty interesting, especially when you, can, when you, connected, <laughs> when you connected to other services, and it got. Um, the, the Google's is funny, hey buddy, hey buddy. <laughs> but still, overall, that's pretty accurate. I mean, that's, that's way better than you'd get from telephone grade audio. Um, it's certainly close enough to run through a natural language engine. So I'm not going to demo too much more of this because I'm also going to use this for my dangerous demo. I'm going to get a little bit more dangerous. If you want to see more of this, uh, come to Dangerous Demos next door at 4, after this talk. Um, but yeah, so that, those, that's an example of three of the um, recognition engines. All right, if we go back to the slides, um, the next group I want to talk about are the natural language understanding focus. So these next couple companies really focus on taking text that's been recognized and giving you back parsed intents so you can understand what the question is and what the parameters of the question are. I'll start with WIT. Um, WIT was, you know, the first one I really ever played with with this technology, and it's, it's very cool. 
Um, the screenshots I showed you earlier where it was parsing out the sentence, those come from Wit. I really should have put the Facebook logo up here because they've been owned by Facebook for over a year now. Um, they do offer an API endpoint that does speech recognition. So theoretically, you can feed audio into it and get understood responses back out. It's not terribly well documented. They don't list the languages that they cover. So I kind of left it as a question mark. Um, but they do claim it's production ready. Way more interesting to me, though, is that they cover 50 languages of natural language understanding. So you, you can build your bot to understand uh, 50 different languages, and you'll get back the structured questions. Um, you still have to build your app to be multilingual, obviously, because, yeah. Um, what else? It's free. That's kind of interesting. Because Facebook is running this as, I think, it kind of an experiment in how that people will use it and integrate it into their platform, it costs nothing. Um, you can go sign up, and I use GitHub to sign up, and it's very simple to get started. They allow you to upload Wave MP3 U-Log, again, that, like I said, not so interesting. It has a very easy REST JSON interface and a, a really nice dashboard for testing. You can actually go into, the web, into their website and type your questions even before you've built the bot, and it'll parse out the responses for you. So that's pretty cool. Um, unfortunately, though, WIT has somewhat stagnated. I guess Facebook is focusing their engineering on ways to use that technology on internal tools. So I've started looking, and you can't pay for it, which is kind of my other requirement. I've started looking at others. Um, as I mentioned, API was kind of the place I was looking for uh, to replace WIT, and then they went and got themselves bought by Google. So I don't know what's gonna happen there. Um, but it's still, it's still available, you can still buy it. They actually don't offer any speech recognition at all. So you do need to hook in something else to get your audio recognized. But once you have the text back, they offer 12 languages of um, NLU. It has a free tier for development and then tiered pricing. I think there are three tiers. Um, first one's like $100 a month, and it's a lot of queries. So basically, it depends on how much volume you send to them. No audio inputs, and it has a very simple REST JSON response. So I want to demo this. Um, I think the best way to show this is to show it. Um, OK, so whoops, that's not the right window. And you can't see it anyway. All right, this is a tool that we built at work. Um, I mentioned Slack earlier. It's sort of like Slack. Basically, it's a chat tool that we use internally. And we have this thing. So the name of the app is Nitro. Nitro is the name of the software package. And we thought it'd be really cool if you could talk to it. And maybe I can say things like, how much did we sell last week in Georgia? And hopefully, if everything goes well, this text will be fed into Wit. Oh, yeah, there. It's pretty quick. Um, so the text goes to Wit for understanding, comes back as a structured intent. I search the database based on the parameters, and it gives me back for the week beginning September 19th, so it knows when and the duration. It also knows, uh, well, it didn't get the territory right. It says across the company. It should have said in Georgia. And it shows 1,100 projects for a total of $12 million. But I could also do something like, um, in Chicago, how many appointments did we set yesterday? So you can see the structure of the question is pretty different. Um, for, yeah, it's definitely missing the territory. Oh, I know why, too. We changed our territories. I've got to fix that. Um, but yeah, so you can see it's, it's pulling out the entities and running the query against the database. And I can really slice it kind of however I want. A lot of the heavy lifting of figuring out what the parameters are, all of that's handled by the natural language engine. Um, let's see, I have one more question to ask it. Oh. How many reps are in the home right now? So we have a sales force that's out uh, demoing the product for homeowners, and I can ask it how many people are actually in the home. So again, we know this based on the mobile app that we give to all of our people in the field. Oh, I'm running locally, so there aren't any reps in the home right now. Anyway, um, that's just kind of an example of what you can do with text as an input. Now imagine taking this and flipping it to something that used audio as an input. The other demo I want to show you on the same line is, oops, there you are. So who has heard of Echo? Or who has an Echo? Yeah, I love Echo. Echo's so much fun. So I, I, um, I wanted to actually demonstrate with my actual Echo. <laughs> Echo works great on Wi-Fi as long as there's not a captive portal where you actually have to type a password to get logged in. Um, so that didn't work. But I had this really slick Amazon Echo simulator, which I'm going to do the same thing. So Echo has, um, and actually, I, got, I jumped ahead of myself a little bit here. Echo has its own platform for building natural language 
apps. And so I want, I'll just demo you the same basic application, but this time running on the Echo instead. So we'll say something like, Alexa, ask Nitro how many reps are in the home right now. And this one's actually linked to production, so it should work. Right now there are 381 reps in homes. Alexa, ask Nitro how much we sold last week in Massachusetts. Last week, in Massachusetts, we sold 62 projects for a total of $814,000. So imagine this sitting on your desk or sitting on an executive's desk, and any time he can just ask a question and get an answer, insight into his business. That's kind of the thinking behind this. And yes, this sits on my desk at work, and it's a great conversation starter. They are real numbers. They're coming from our live database. Yeah. Um, all right. So I've mentioned the options that you can use for building yourself, right? I've mentioned uh, the platforms that kind of give you the toolkit for speech recognition, natural language processing. There are two other contenders that I really, this conversation wouldn't be complete if I didn't at least mention them. The first one is Siri. Everybody knows Siri. Um, Siri is great. It actually supports 21 languages. It's production ready. It's free. Um, until, until this year, until, when was our announcement? I guess it was, I guess they made the announcement in, this, in, the, uh, in June and they just released the dev kits uh, in the last month or so. Until recently, developers had no access to Siri. You basically had to be inside Apple to use Siri and that's now different, that's changed. Um, so that's great news, right? Everybody who's got one of these in their pocket can now write an app for it and talk to it. The problem is, there are a couple kind of obvious ones. The first is, obviously, you're locked into iOS. But let's assume you're even willing to live with that, because that's still a pretty big platform. It's also locked to six domains. And this is kind of an interesting restriction. Apple has chosen only to pursue apps that support messaging. So, um, you know, send a message to whatever on WhatsApp, or, you know, send a message to um, Tim Wenhold on Skype, something like that. They support payments, so send money to my daughter to get out of jail or something. Let's hope that's not the case. Um, transportation, call me an Uber. I want to go to the airport. Photo search, um, you know, find me pictures of my wife. Voice or IP calling, so this is kind of neat because now you can actually call, uh, you know, using the, the, not just the built-in dialer. Workouts and health, so you can track your um, your activity points and automotive, uh, navigation and, and playing music, those kind of things. So if you want to build anything that doesn't fall into one of those categories, you're kind of on your own, which is unfortunate. They'll, they'll probably ultimately allow more developer creativity. But I should also mention, you can still do a lot with this. Just the messaging in particular, you probably saw that the main use case I have here is essentially a messaging app. I could just as easily wire up Siri to ask Nitro, send a message to Nitro as an instant message and get back the response as an instant message. So there's still a pretty good opportunity there. And of course, the other one is Alexa. Um, it has... <laughs> One language, so as long as you can have it in any language you like, as long as it's English. Um, it is production ready, it's also free and Amazon subsidized. In fact, there's even an app store, so if you can figure out how to get people to pay for it, you can make money. Um, it has a really nice interface, um, REST JSON, but it is constrained to the Amazon ecosystem, which means things like if the user wants to enroll in your app, they've gotta have an Amazon account. And, and for a lot of the richer, more interesting things that you wanna do, they'll either need the mobile app or they'll need to go to the website. You can still do some pretty cool stuff with it, but it's sort of a funky enrollment process. Um, but it's worth mentioning because it is very cool. All right, so I'm just gonna kind of sum everything up here. We looked at uh, five different competitors. I kind of lumped API.ai into Google. Um, but so this is, this is the breakdown, right? On, the, uh, on Nuance, you have a fairly good speech recognition, but no natural language. Watson's kind of in the middle. Google, lots of speech recognition, but no natural language. Uh, all that's coming, right? Because they just acquired API to AI. And then WIT, they have ASR, kind of, but they definitely have natural language covered. Um, the costs, IBM's relatively expensive, Google's relatively cheap, WIT is relatively free, as long as you can stand a product that Facebook can change its mind about at any point in the future. Um, the strengths really are, I think for Nuance, the speech recognition accuracy. They've been in this market a long time. They have excellent language coverage. They're battle tested. It's, it's really a good product. Um, but that's kind of it. That's really, you know, as far as weaknesses go, their dev tools are kind of non-existent. The documentation is thin. Um, and I think the biggest weakness is complacency. They have, they were the market leader and they haven't really kept up. I'm not sure, there looks like they're kind of starting to play catch up now, but that's a bad place to be in. Um, 
On the other hand, you have something like IBM Watson. Their biggest strength is just the number of things you can do with it. They have a bunch of other APIs for things like uh, visual recognition, um, for sentiment analysis of documents, for speech synthesis. I didn't even talk about text-to-speech, but um, Google Cloud and IBM Watson both have excellent speech synthesis as well. Their developer UX starts out pretty nice. They've got a nice dashboard. They've got good tools, good documentation. But the sheer number of products, some of which overlap with each other, I found very confusing. I found it hard to figure out exactly which combination of APIs that I needed, um, which is something I would also say about Google, although I think, I think IBM made it even a little bit harder. Um, Google, 80 languages. That's just unreal. That's a lot of language coverage for speech recognition. They also have other APIs. They have some pretty cool, at Google I.O. this year, they had a really neat demo where you could go take a picture, and they would have you make faces. Like, they'd have you smile, they'd have you frown, they'd have you look surprised. And the computer would look at your face and would give you a plot of, well, he's 80% happy and he's 30% surprised. So imagine combine, or, or take a photo and extract features from it. So this is a picture of a flower, or this is a picture of a dog, or even this is a picture of a poodle, and this is a greyhound. They can get some pretty interesting specific stuff with their, with their platform. So I think that's a, a big strength if you start to think about how you can combine the various machine learning options. Um, downsides, it's still in beta, technically. Works well for me, but they say it's beta. Um, also, no conversational natural language support. So like I said, you really, they aren't a one-stop shop. Google is the closest to a one-stop shop. Um, but pretty much for everything I built, I had to combine a speech recognition engine over here and a natural language engine over here. Last one is WIT, love WIT, great developer experience, great documentation, um, but it's free, you can't pay Facebook for it, and it lacks uh, really strong speech recognition as an input. That's pretty much it, that's what I've got for you. Um, I would love to answer any questions.